So um, like you had mentioned before, I, um, I'm in the MPH program. My focus is specifically in health equity. And um, as I was telling you before, uh, our school has specific concentrations like any MPH program, but you can also create your own sort of track or your own concentration. And so initially when I had applied um, to, to Bloomberg, I wanted to focus on adolescent health um, since I work with a youth nonprofit. But as I was um, going into the program and as I was doing work at the Florida Department of Health, I really started sort of realizing that I, okay, I, I want to acquire skills that could take me into any sort of area in public health. And I felt like health equity was a really good basis and framework with which to look at. Um, it's what we're all talking about right now, right? And all, all that we're, we're trying to do. But I really like the idea of, again, being able to take health equity, which is often this theory, and like bring it into practice. Like, what does it look like? Welcome to Public Health Careers. I'm your host, Omari Richards, founder of the Public Health Millennial. We're going to dive deep into public health topics and career journeys. You'll hear diverse career stories, absorb professional development and career strategies, get tips while also learning from others to help you in your own journey and learning of public health. Learn about the vast world of public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories. Stay tuned so we can do our part towards a culture of health, well-being, and equity for all. Welcome to Public Health Careers. Today we have a public health strategist, eloquent and passionate public speaker, thought and servant leader, and published writer, as well as a current master public health candidate at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He got his bachelor's in biology at American University and has done work both in the U.S. and his hometown of the U.S. Virgin Islands. As stated earlier, he is an MPH candidate at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in health equity. We have Ajayi Pickering Haynes. Welcome to the show. Thank you, man. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you for um, giving me the space and the time to talk a little bit about myself. Um, I'm super excited. So as am I, as am I. Um, it's, it's always awesome to see another, another people from the islands doing great things I know. The public health work. So like, we're to, always, we always have, happy. We have to. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, we have to support each other. So, so I appreciate that. So uh, how, how, how are you doing? How are you doing? I'm good. Um, I'm good. I have been um, really busy between work and graduate school and um, the nonprofit I work with, but I'm doing good. I think 2022 has been a fast but busy year at the same time. I'm sure a lot of people relate, um, but I'm blessed and I'm grateful and I feel like I'm in a really good space, um, really transformative space uh, career wise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are. And I uh, look forward to seeing like where, where the journey takes you. I know you're a student now, probably lots of opportunities, lots of thoughts of like what you're going to be doing afterwards. So look forward to see how that how that all unfolds and are uh, happy to like have you part of my part of my network going forward. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us how do you identify and a little bit about your personal background? Sure. So um, my name is Ajay Pickering Haynes. Um, Ajay actually means messenger of God. Um, I identify as he, him, his. And like he stated, I'm originally from St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, and, you know, when I think about um, my sort of journey and ascent into public health, it goes all the way back to my roots, being from St. Thomas. Um, I grew up very curious and inquisitive about, like, science and health. Like, I was always su super... Um, just curious about the way um, science and health worked and um, being from a small island too and being around, you know, from a small community where everyone knows each other. Um, I was always very sort of community driven in a lot of different projects um, and opportunities at home. Um, my, the senior, the year, the summer before my senior year, I actually interned with the medical examiner here at home. And that was really sort of my first introduction into public health. Um, I was able to go on scene with him. I was able to see autopsies be done with him. Um, at the time, I had expressed interest um, in, in doing that. And um, it was really awesome to sort of learn the way that public health informs death investigation, but then how death investigation always also informs public health. Um, and so, yeah, after I had that experience and I left the islands, I moved to D.C., uh, where I went to American University. And as I mentioned, I um, was a pre-med biology major at the time, but I also had the opportunity to uh, be a part of a leadership and ethical development program during my time there. 
Um, and the really cool thing about that is um, there were a lot of issues, sort of structural and systemic issues that I had noticed um, growing up in the Virgin Islands. And being part of a leadership program in undergrad gave me the chance to like learn a lot more about what those root causes of those issues were. Um, a lot of the issues that we see um, that impact public health. So um, that's, that's just a little bit about who I am and like how I got into public health. I was interested in public health way before I knew it. I always tell people that. Um, but I'm really grateful to be here, really, um, really just excited to be part of such a great field uh, of so many dedicated, um, passionate leaders um, and thankful for people like you who provide this space, you know, for, for people to share a little bit more about um, about what they do and what they love doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm hoping like your story and more stories like this can inspire other people from Caribbean islands to this kind of work because I think there's a huge need for it. Uh, and then like to your point is like, we don't know about it or we don't know the words for it. So like just continuing to share these kinds of stories and these kinds of narratives are important for people to know like, okay, this is something that I can do and I can be impactful right. and do a lot of great work doing this type of work, um, which I think is is like the point of this episode, the point of this, these conversations, just so people are exposed and, and know like public health is a thing because like you, I, I had no idea what public health was. It was a pre-med bio major as well. Um, well but thankfully... I'm Thankfully for my way into public health, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad for that. Hey y'all, you may be looking for ways to show support for public health, health equity, and this platform, The Public Health Millennial. Well, head over to my shop at theph.millennial.com forward slash shop to buy and support if this show has helped you. Also, use the code podcast for 20% off your next order. Link is in the description to the shop. Be sure to tag me on Instagram at theph.millennial. Thank you. I look forward to sharing your pick. Now back to the show. Um, and before we get more into your story, what does public health mean to you? Wow, that's such a good but hard <laughs> question to answer. Um, I think, I, I, I don't know, I could use a couple different words to describe public health. To me, public health is a calling. To me, public health is storytelling. Um, to me, public health is community and collaboration. Um, it is systems. Um, they, there's so many facets and areas. Um, but I, one of my mentors always says, we are public health. And at the end of the day, I think that's what really it represents people, you know? Um, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Okay. So before we talk about your bachelor's in biology at American University, as, as you spoke about, you said before your senior year, you worked with the medical examiner. And you said that this was like public health work for you, but maybe at that point in time, you didn't have the word for public health. Like looking back on it now, how how do you identify that as like public health work? So um, when I was at the medical examiner office, um, there was a lot of sort of death investigation that I realized was informing public health. The um, medical examiner office in St. Thomas, like other... Um, medical examiner jurisdictions worked very closely with like the Department of Health and other sort of public health agencies. Um, a lot of the medical examiner offices also have like an epidemiologist, uh, what they call a forensic epidemiologist that typically collects data and looks at, um, you know, patterns of disease and patterns of death. Um, and, and being part of that internship really opened my eye to that because um, based on what I had known about death investigation, I really just thought it was like going on scene and doing autopsies and then that's it. I didn't realize how impactful um, just doing one, figuring out one person's death was to the larger system of preventing death, right? Because at the end of the day, like that's public health role to prevent death. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was a really like captivating experience and not to jump ahead, but I, I ended up um, taking an internship in DC at the DC Medical Examiner Office. Um, and that was like, what I had before my senior year on steroids. And I was, I was just, I was like a kid who, at Christmas, honestly, just so excited. And I um, actually, during the internship, I actually worked on a public health project at the time with the forensic epidemiologist in DC. And I, I loved, I loved death investigation. I loved looking at like a single person's death, but what was more fascinating to me is like, having the ability to impact and influence like larger systems, right? And I think um, that's, that's been sort of 
my understanding and trajectory of how the two sort of relate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love, love that. I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about the the uh, steroids of learning about this that investigation in DC. But okay, so you you're coming from St. Thomas, a very small island, and then going to DC to get your bachelor's of biology at American University. So, what was the thought process there, and what was that like transition like for you? That's a great question. Um, so I had been in love with DC from middle school because I had um, taken a trip in middle school to DC and just loved everything about it. I love how like career oriented it is, but I also love that it was very diverse and that um, I feel like in DC, like DC is a place where things happen, like it, where changers and movers and makers are. So I, I really loved the thought of being in DC. And so, um, yeah, I had applied to a few schools in the D.C. area and American University turned out to be the school that I think um, accepted me and probably gave me the most financial aid. And I am so happy with the decision I made because I had was able to take advantage of so many other opportunities that I didn't even see ahead. You know, um, one of them was the leadership program that I was a part of, like I mentioned, um, and that program really provided me with the tools, some of the tools I needed to, again, I was talking about those systems issues, like some of the tools needed to address things on, on that sort of level. Um, but what was awesome about my program at American University is that it was a very small biology program. And so I knew everyone, I knew all the professors, and it very much mirrored sort of the community feel within my program that I felt coming from a really small island. Um, I was not a fan of the weather, hence why I do not live in DC anymore. <laughs> but um, but I, I really enjoyed my time there, and it, I think it has set me up for so much of um, of the opportunities I am taking advantage of now. Yeah, and I think that's a very important point that you're making. Like, especially for me, like when I came, my my uh, my bachelor's program was also pretty small the biology program a lot of classes were like 20 students and stuff like that so very manageable it's not like you know a huge lecture with 500 people right so I, <laughs> and i think that that's like something we don't think about but it's very very important especially very. us coming from from places that are a lot smaller when you have mm -hmm. to like adjust to so many different different things and just learn things that you don't know about um i think having that small knit community is very helpful in in the long run and and also like building out that community and making you understand like the nuances of living in the US, which would right. be interesting in itself. It can be because to be to be quite frank, that was my first time living in the US. So I left mm -hmm. St. Thomas two weeks after my high school graduation and was gone, you know. Um so it it definitely it definitely was an adjustment. Um luckily I had a few other folks from the Virgin Islands and from the Caribbean um who were on campus and so I found that community, like you mentioned. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely a transition for people who, you know, you grow up with a, a whole different sort of lifestyle. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's also important that you mentioned that you you try to find people that are similar to you, that have, have had similar experiences to you and like reach out to them or like just get insights because you never know like what they have gone through and how that could be helpful in your journey. Um, right. So, so I appreciate you sharing that. Okay, so going, going back to like your certificate, well, going to your certificate in leadership and ethical development, what was the process for you like getting that certificate and what were the main things you learned from it? That's a great question. So it was a four-year certificate program. Um, it was specifically for um, leaders in the College of Arts and Sciences. And um, each year had like something major that you had to focus on. So the first two years were um were like lecture based on um, where we would meet with our mentor or a professor at the time um the second year we had to do a symposium presentation um, on a huge topic the third year you had to do an internship which is what i did at the medical examiner office and then the fourth year you had a capstone um like other programs um but the program also included like community service um like different projects like cohort-based projects that we worked on a lot of it was focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, how to lead your own life by acquiring like specific soft skills. Um, it was just all the elements, I think, that college students need that they don't get from their regular academic classes. Um, so it was really, really useful for me um, and for my peers. And I'm still super close to 
um, my mentor who who was in the program um, up until this day. So um, so yeah, I I I I think that a, a huge hallmark or part of my experience at um at AU was because of the leadership program. At the time, it it also sort of gave me I think a lot of college students sometimes like face imposter syndrome, um, especially if you come from a place that's underrepresented. And um, because I was part of the leadership program, it, it sort of like gave me a confidence and a voice as, as I was moving through undergrad that I am very grateful for now um, as I navigate professional spaces. So, um, so yeah, it, it was an awesome experience getting the certificate. Yeah, that definitely sounds like it. And and I think like you're right on point with like, if you're just a bachelor's student, you really do not get those professional development experiences unless you really actively go out and, and get them. So it's awesome that you were able to get this leadership certificate and it was able to like really force you quote unquote to, right. to put yourself in these professional development spaces for you to be in a space where you feel confident to speak up and, and let your voice be heard which I think is, is all important and it's like hard in undergrad especially like transitioning from high school to, to college yep. life and and doing all those things so, so shout out to you for that thank you yeah 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 and now going back to your medical examiner on steroids here so you said you were a death investigation intern and researcher at the office of the chief medical examiner. So how did you get this internship, first of all? And then what was it about? How was it different from the experience you had in high school? So this in, this is funny. This internship experience was my junior year, but I knew that I wanted to intern there from the very first day I moved to D.C. Like, I kid you not. I looked up the medical examiner office in my freshman year, and I noticed that the office was being run by a black man. And that was just like so much validation for me, so much inspiration for me. And I remember thinking, I don't know how I'm gonna end up there, but it's gonna happen. And so, yeah, I, I interned there my junior year, regular application process, um, that sort of thing, um, letters of recommendation. And then while I was interning there in my junior year, um, every intern had to do a research project. And my research project, were looking at different um, trends, different data trends that were happening in previous years before that were significantly contributing to death. So it was very like public health oriented. But again, like at the time, I didn't really have sort of the language or even the full understanding of how much of public health that really entailed. Um, but yeah, the experience was awesome. I got to go on scene as well. Um, I got to network with different um, investigators and uh, different law enforcement personnel in the space. Um, and at the end of the program, I had to present my project uh, in front of all of the, um, the staff. And it was awesome, too, because I actually was able to have a personal sit down one on one with the chief medical examiner um, at the time. And he was super encouraging. Like he was like, are you ready like, to start today? Like if I give you a job, like, let's go. And um, that's so important, you know, for people like us, for, for us to, to see what's possible. And I always think about that as I navigate my career, um, as young as I may be, because I know we all need sort of that example, you know. So I think that was one, one er area of the experience that um, was really awesome that I didn't really anticipate, but I am super grateful for. Yeah, that, that sounds like a very formative experience. And I think it's always great when you're able to take an experience that you already did and kind of build upon that, as well as like you're understanding the context for it in in the US. In you, you said you're studying like trend data, which is, as you said, very population health focus or public health focus, mm -hmm. um, which which I think is, is important and to get like different perspectives, but just building on that initial experience that you had, which is uh, great. And you also, during your time at AU, you were journaling workshop leader through Thrive DC. So tell us about that experience. Yeah, so like I mentioned, when I was um, at, when I was in DC, um, my leadership program, uh, community service was a huge element. We all had to um, solidify a specific place that we wanted to, um, you know, contribute community service at. And um, I was able to, uh, do some volunteer hours at a um, at a women's and children's homeless shelter in Columbia Heights, and it was awesome because I it was just really great to talk to people. It was really great to you know be of service. 
um, while I was there, I had started a journaling workshop because the um, director of the program had found out that I write, that I write on the side. And so he, he had said that, you know, we really want to bring like a journaling program here um, so that we could provide our clients with the opportunity to just express how they feel, express the challenges that they're going through. And I think that that journaling workshop was like my for, first formal introduction into like lived experience. Like we talk a lot about lived experience in public health. And I was fully immersed in that because um, we sat down and we, we, ju we just talked about everything that related to life. Um, and it was a good opportunity for me to, again, see the value of lived experience, see how it applies to what I do, what I want to do. Um, and I, I, I was really grateful be able to not only volunteer there but also to lead an activity at the homeless shelter that that sounds like an amazing opportunity again and i, I think to, to your point of like that lived experience so much of us go through school looking at data but not really having that perspective of okay this is what someone is actually experiences this is how they're actually feeling these are in the actual woods is the conversations that we're having as opposed to, and i think like that's a huge gap between looking at big data mm -hmm. or Sylvie's data and all of that, and then actually sitting in a room and talking with people up in a focus group, or just like having a listening session to hear, like what are their challenges? What are the things that, that are good? What are the things that could be, use improvement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, right. So yeah, that that's really cool that that you were able to to get that insight from it. Yeah, it was, it was, it was great. I would say um, it was challenging too, because a, um, a lot of the things that I was learning from studying medicine and um, also my leadership program. Um, sometimes I would think one thing or see one thing one way, and then I would be in a journaling workshop and then someone would, would stop me in my tracks and be like, actually, no, that's not my experience. And that was super humbling for me, you know, right? Because here I am in school studying it and looking at these issues, but um, one thing doesn't hold true for everyone, right? And so um, it, from since then, it's always made me just super vigilant and mindful, you know, of um, acquiring information and these degrees and being in academic space is great, but um, it's not the end all be all and it's not enough, you know, to, to really be of service and to really be um, useful in public health. So I will say that was one component that was super humbling <laughs> for me, but, um, but necessary. I, I absolutely love that. And I think, especially and no no shit to academics or academics and academia but i think a lot of a lot of the times it is what does this research say what does this say and then go with that as opposed to sometimes just creating space to have people in community come forward and share their experiences and hear like more of those nuanced situations as opposed to just like thinking it's one thing and i think to that point it's like a lot of us have not limiting beliefs, but just certain beliefs about something. And it can be tough to break those beliefs, especially when we're seeing a certain data continue representing that. But to your point, I think it's important to have those conversations with people because we never know what we are seeing in data that isn't always representative or isn't representative of at all of what someone's experiencing. That's so true. I have to agree. Good, good, good. <laughs> Okay, I'm glad you agree with that one. And then uh, during your time at EU, you had a, a, a few different positions, and I'll just go through the, the four of them, and then you can talk about all four of them. So during your time at American University, you were a counselor, research lab assistant, a technology borrowing and media services desk assistant, a makerspace senior assistant, and a teaching assistant for general biology one. So love to hear more about those experiences. Sure. Yeah. Um, I obviously did a lot in undergrad. Um, <laughs> wouldn't fully recommend it, but, but I took away. I took away a lot. Um, lost a lot of sleep, but um, but definitely took away a lot. Um, no, I think I think one of the things I um, really valued in undergrad is being a part of different experiences, even outside of like what I was studying or what my career choice is. Is um, I actually I always recommend to um, to students I work with um, in my nonprofit and um, students in undergrad to do more than just what you desire to study. You know, because um, I feel like those experiences um, outside of your professional or like academic life really make you um, stand out and equip you with unique skills, right? As you go on to do so many other things. So 
that's what I was doing. I was taking advantage of the opportunity to um, to do that. I was also um, trying to fund living in DC. Um, so some of those jobs were necessary to do that. But um, but it but all of them were great because they really taught me time management. They really taught me um, prioritizing and managing my time, which is something um, that I am I have to heavily do right now um, in graduate school as well, working full time. Um, but yeah, without going into the into the weeds of every single one, I just think that um, they, it was great to be able to to do things that were interesting outside of just medicine or biology. Um, and I'm sure you you know you relate to that with your experiences as well. Absolutely, I think it's, it's so so important because we aren't just people that but like students aren't just people that study things like we are whole human beings that have a whole bunch of facets to our lives. So I think like engaging in all those different facets, especially on college campuses where they, they provide you a lot of opportunities. And as a student, you have a lot of opportunities to engage in things that are outside of the classroom. Definitely recommend people take take those opportunities up and like just try to grow and learn and put themselves in spaces where they can actually like just become better people for themselves going forward. Right, for sure, yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, and were there any other... Any other uh, any other undergrad takeaways that you had? Um, I learned so much about undergrad. I feel like undergrad, um, really taught me. Like it's, I, I was kind of remember. I had to remember a lot of like who I am at my core. You know, um, one of the things at undergrad that really stood out for me was, um, I had always told myself like I'm only gonna do something if it's meaningful to me. I'm not going to do something for the resume. I'm not going to do something because it looks good or because somebody else is doing it. Um, and I think that's important to mention because a lot of college students are under immense pressure right now. Um, it's become so, as you know, like competitive and like career driven and you're just an undergrad. Like you can just do school and that is a okay. You don't have to do 500 things. But yeah, I had made like a commitment to myself that I was only going to do something if it was meaningful to me. Um, even if, um, like I wasn't just going to do it because it looked good. And I felt like that was really, really important, um, for me and kept me sort of sane, you know, um, I would say in undergrad too, I had to learn how I learn, you know, um, because in high school, I didn't fully know that, or at least the way I was learning things wasn't the way that was best for me. And so I had to learn really quickly how I learned. Um, and it might sound really sort of fundamental, but I think it's been really useful for me, even now in my graduate program, where I'm really comfortable with, with how I process and acquire information, even in my career, you know, when you're reading information about um, like new literature or um, different initiatives or things that are happening. So I would say like undergrad is a great space to figure that out, like figure out how you learn best. Um, reading a textbook has never worked for me. So I had to really learn some other ways to to sort of engage with the material and and take away things from it um and yeah i would say those were the two i think two major takeaways that i had in undergrad i love those insights i, I think they're very very important and yeah most more people should should like just have that perspective um i think it's, it's uh one that could really benefit you going forward and Okay, so after you graduated, you became an AmeriCorps student success coach at City Year. Tell, mm -hmm. tell me how, like, what was the thought process of going into this AmeriCorps program? And then, like, tell me more about that. So I'm really glad you asked that because um, that was a very sort of unconventional choice. Um, there is a thought leader um, by the name of Tiffany Aliche that talks about the third choice. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I know Tiffany. But yeah, um, the third choice um, is usually the option that you don't typically see. Like usually in life, we think we have two choices, right? Mm -hmm. Left or right. The third choice is like you going down a whole other path that doesn't make any sense, that people don't understand. That was what that was for me. Um, I had left undergrad and I, I didn't want to work in a lab. I didn't want to work at a hospital, which would have made the most sense to some people. Um, I really wanted to do something um, more working with students. But I think after do, being really successful in undergrad, I was like, okay, I want to like contribute to to students and to the academic journey. And so I ended up uh, moving to Orlando, uh, where I still live, 
um, and being a part of CD year, um, being a student success coach. Uh, I was actually working at a um, Title I school during my time there um, in one of the most challenging underfunded schools um, in that area. And um, it just taught me a lot about education. It actually, it also made me realize that public, I, was, I was a little bit more leaning towards the side of public health and medicine. Um, and it lamented um, me even working with a nonprofit now, which I can talk a little bit about more later since it is a youth nonprofit. But, um, but no, I, I'm happy you asked that because I think we often only see two choices. And um, I, I highly encourage people to sometimes choose a third choice because you never know where it will lead you to. Um, and I can tell you that that choice has, you know, built all the other pathways that I have been on since then. I, I love that. I love that so much. And and I think like that third choice is, is really important. And there's that perspective of like so many times in life, we think it's a dichotomy of it's either this or it's that, but there's a spectrum of things that we can do. And so many right. people kind of like blind themselves to only those two options. And it's like, if I'm not doing this or I'm not doing this, I'm a failure or like, I'm not following the right path or whatever the case, who, what, whatever the right path is. But to, to that point, I think there's just so much that we can learn when we kind of like not only listen to what society has, but just have belief in our understanding of, okay, this is something that mightn't seem exactly aligned, but it's something that we can build off of and lean from and right. grow. And right. one, one other thing is like too, too many times in, in life, we have limiting beliefs on things that we should do or shouldn't do because of other people. And right. many of those other people, they, they mean well, but they, it's, it's not... It's not to say like they are in the position that you want to be in. So sometimes it's to take the, the advice with a grain of salt or just like listen to it, but also hear other perspectives. So, so yeah, that, that that's amazing that you were able to do that and um, move to somewhere that's a little more warm. Yes, that, that was the goal. That was the number one. Like, <laughs> okay, we got to, I love DC, but like these winters and the, and when I was in DC, they had like record winters. So I was like, uh-uh, <laughs> like time for me to pack up and go. <laughs> Like, I'm not ready to go back to St. Thomas, but we have to find somewhere else a little bit warmer. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you mentioned that you, because you finished your biology degree and everyone's like pre-med biology. So, you're, oh, you're probably going to medical school. But then you said like during this experience, you learned that you're probably more interested in the public health realm of like health improvement as opposed to like the medical route. When when did you learn about the word public health? Did you have that word at that time? And like, what, what was that? That thought process for you? So two, two major things happened after I was at CD year. Um, I had worked at Orlando Health for some time after CD year. Um, I was working in guest services and then I was working um, in the pathology lab because I was still considering um, like medicine, like being a pathologist, but I was like, I need more like experience, like definitive experience to really sort of make my decision um, and I actually had applied to medical school, like in full honesty, I, I went through the process. I was like doing, doing the whole thing. And as I was going through the process, cause you know, you have all these essays and things that you have to do. I realized like every single thing I'm writing about is about systems and public health and not necessarily about like working with an individual patient. And so I had, to, I really had to think like, do you really want, like, what do you really want? Like, what sort of work do you really want to be doing? Um, so that was one thing that happened. And then I, also in 2020, I had started working with a nonprofit uh, in the Virgin Islands um, remotely. Um, and the nonprofit, the youth nonprofit, um, a lot of the work that I was doing, I had started off doing a uh, sexual risk avoidance education course with some youth. Um, a lot of it was very public health oriented work. Like I was learning about how to write grants and um, how to scale programs. And there were just a lot of things that I realized like, wait, this is actually public health that you're doing. And I was loving it and enjoying it. And so, um, yeah. And so I, after deciding like, okay, I don't want to go to medical school. Like at the time I was like, it's not off the table, but it's definitely not something I want to do right now. Um, I had started really researching like, okay, I like to, I like systems and like innovation and programming, 
but I also enjoy like collaborating. Um, and I also, I'm trying to work on my grant, ma right, making, grant writing skills. And I was like, this is public health. Like this is public health kind of one-on-one almost. It does make sense. Um, and so after I left Orlando Health, after I had made the decision to like move into public health, I was looking for, um, for jobs in the field for maybe about a year. And finally was able to get a role at the Florida Department of Health in Seminole County, which is the county right next to where I live. And, um, and then I had applied for, um, for my master's um, program as well around that time. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we, we'll get to a lot of those, but I think like that, that point of you going through the process of applying to medical school and like the writing and reflecting. And then when you're looking back and thinking, you know, well, I'm I'm not really talking about like patient provider stuff. Eh? I'm talking about systems level, population level changes, and like having that that honesty and like understanding in yourself to know that, okay, like I may have been going down this path toward like wanting to become a physician, wanted to go into medicine, but in everything that I'm writing and I'm talking about here, it definitely aligns more with public health work. And I think that that is key. And a lot of us don't even get that time to sit down and think. And I, I think it's important like for you to, to share this because so, so many of us just continue down a path because of the past experiences and like the past thoughts and the past wants mm -hmm. that we have, but we never really sit down and question, is this still what I want? Is this still right. the kind of work that I want to do? And right. I'm, I'm happy that like through your applications, you were able to sit, to sit down and think, uh, not really, this is not really how, right. how can, and, and how can I learn more about public health and to see like, if this is what I would rather do and not just, and I like, I like to your point, it's like medical school isn't off the table. Medical school is always going to be there. They're always going to want to take your money and let you apply right. for this school. So, so there's, 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 I just like that perspective. So, so I appreciate you sharing that. I have to agree with you. And I, um, something else I want to mention too is, um, I, you, you mentioned like the reflection process and, um, kind of like letting go of one thing and like opening your mind to other things you know, it's so important to just like trust yourself and do what feels right. I think one thing that I have always been really good at um, at a child, as a child, they used to call it being stubborn, but I call it just doing what feels right. You know what I mean? I've always been um, sort of that way. And I think it's really served me because um, it, do it doesn't have to make sense to other people, but if it feels right to me, um, that's the path I'm going to choose. And I think it's so important for people to hear that, like you mentioned, you know, it's okay to change your mind. It's okay to go down a different path. If it's what feels right to you, then absolutely. Um, you have one life, right? As they say, so might as well, might as well do what you want with it, um, you know, um, but yeah. Yeah, because at the end of the day, it's like you're living your life for you and you don't want to look back 60 years from now and regret something that you did because someone else put right. that on you as opposed to you wanting to do something. So I think that's important. Very, very mm -hmm. important. Um, so, so tell us a little bit more about your experience at uh, Orlando Health as a patient guest service representative and in the pathology department. Yeah, so it was, um, I enjoyed my time at Orlando Health. Um, I think it was the first time I, I was working for a major hospital system. Um, and I Initially, when I applied to Orlando Health, I actually applied to work in pathology, and I didn't end up getting a role. So I was like, okay, where can I start? So I started in guest services, um, and that experience was super um, valuable for me um, because I was working directly with families. I was working directly with patients. And again, like I talked about that lived experience, I was seeing the challenges. I was seeing the way that people interact with healthcare, with the medical system, um, and learn just learning so much from that. So um, it, it was it was during COVID, so it was it was a bit challenging with all the changes all of us were experiencing in the world. Um, but I I had enjoyed my time there, and after shortly after being in guest services, I think for about a year, I finally was able to matriculate over to the pathology lab, <clears throat> and in that role. I actually was was for the first time really using my biology degree because I was um I was working closely with a pathologist to to work on send out tests so different genetic panels tumor panels that Orlando Health didn't have um, the infrastructure or the equipment to do 
I would send out to other testing labs. Um, but what was also really interesting about that experience is that I was able to really learn and see how things like insurance coverage and the, the exorbitant cost uh, of expenditure in the healthcare system was plaguing families. Um, I There were tests being ordered before I was there that were $10,000 more at one company when we could just go to another company and order the same test and it's $10,000 less. So um, I was happy that I cared enough, <laughs> you know, to to sort of advocate for patients on that level. Um, but it, it was it was a valuable experience um, because I got the chance to work with pathologists, got the chance to work with residents. And I think it was the last like push I needed to, okay, I really want to go into public health now. Like this isn't what I want to do long term. Um, but there certainly were a lot of um, skills, like I said, that I had been acquiring over the years that I was able to apply into the role. And I had a great time working with the pathologists there. They were a really great team. Um, they wrote me some really strong letters of recommendation for graduate school. <clears throat> so it, it, it was a great experience overall during my time there. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that, that's awesome. And, and I, I also like that, even though you, you were thinking, okay, maybe medical school isn't for me, you still like put yourself in, in an environment where you can learn both about like medical school and like more population level type mm -hmm. stuff. And from those experiences and from those interactions with people, it like more solidified your decision to, mm -hmm. to go to like this public health route, which I think is important because there's no need to like just up and jump into one thing when, when, mm -hmm. cause we can take time to do things. So many people tell us like we have to do this by this age or this by this time, but you can take time to, to do things. And I think it's important because a lot of these things are heavy investments that we have to make. Right. And, and especially as like younger adults, it, it's, it's tough to like think about all these things. So I, I, I advocate and I hope that people are, are like taking time to really think about the investments that they make before they, whether they push you in medical school or whether they push you in a master of public health. So, so I, I appreciate agree. that. Yeah. Yeah. And you are currently the assistant director of the youth programming partnerships and advocacy for positive youth development VI, which is a nonprofit you're talking about in um, the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, is it specific to, to St. Thomas or? Yes, it's specific okay. to St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you started there being a program coordinator. So how, how do you get involved with this organization? And then tell me about like, what, what, what do you all do? And, and, and I know you, you mentioned a little bit about like sexual risk avoidance. Um, but, but yeah, tell me more. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, I, so yeah, like I mentioned during the pandemic, um, they were searching for a program coordinator to work on a um, sexual health education grant. Um, I have always had a desire and passion for working with youth from since I've been in the Virgin Islands, but I certainly didn't feel like I was qualified to teach about sex ed. Like I was just like, I am not the person for this, but I still, <laughs> I still took the role. Um, I, it followed a very specific curriculum. So that was helpful. But what was also great is that I was able to, a lot of the um, experiences I had learned in my leadership program, like professional development and personal development, I was also able to bring that into the program as a program coordinator. Um, and so after that grant ended, um, you know, we had formally started Positive Youth Development Virgin Islands, and we really wanted to start, do, you know, doing youth development work in the community. A lot of the organizations at the time, because it was COVID, um, weren't in operation. And so youth weren't being stimulated. Um, there was a huge um, learning loss and learning retention that was happening in the community. And they, they just weren't, there just weren't things for them to do. And so me and a team of individuals um, had applied for a um, grant after that program ended, um, a 21st century program grant. And so now we actually operate a 21st century community learning center as a sub grantee here in the US Virgin Islands. Um, we offer uh, academic support and academic tutoring. Uh, we have a drumline program. Uh, we have leadership development. The, the majority of the program and the after school program really focuses on, um, on personal development. Um, so things that go outside of just academics. Um, but one of the awesome things um, about me being in public health as I'm in this program is that I've been able to really apply a lot of my public health knowledge 
in the program. So in addition to the services that we offer, I've been really um, intentional about partnering with different organizations and agencies in the Virgin Islands to ensure that some of those other needs that our students have, that they get. Um, we all know that um, academics alone aren't the only thing that are impacting their development. Um, obviously, like again, I talk about systems, them having access to food, them, um, you know, their income, things of that nature um, affect uh, how well they do in school and how good they feel about themselves as well. So, um, so yeah, I've been serving as a project director uh, for that program. Um, and my main role, since I'm not located in the Virgin Islands, has been to provide like consulting and like more technical assistance to all of the folks on the ground. Um, the cool thing about me being a student success coach is that I have been where they're at. Like I have tutored students, I have worked students with on a one-on-one -on -one level. And so I'm really happy that I had that experience because I'm able to bring that lens into being um, the project director as well. I think a lot of times, um, to no fault of their own leaders who didn't really come up through the ranks and different things, don't sort of have an understanding of what things look like boots on the ground. But because I've, um, because I've worked with students really closely, I've been a student um, for too long myself, <laughs> um, I, I sort of have that insight. So, so yeah, and in, in addition to our after school program, you know, I, we just do a lot of uh, work in the community with leveraging partnerships, um, part of a community um, youth advisory board with different community partners who meet um, quarterly to discuss different issues that families and students are facing in the Virgin Islands. So we're still very new um, as an as a organization to the U.S. Virgin Islands, but slowly sort of making our footprint. And I've really been trying, um, as I lead the organization, to do things in a way that align with a lot of other agencies and not to operate in a silo, you know? So it's, it's been a really, um, really challenging, but great experience uh, for me, especially as it relates to my leadership development. Yo, are you looking for an online community to connect with like-minded health focused people? Join my free community health and wellness discord server at the phmillennial.com forward slash join. You'll find growth focused people talking about important community and personal health topics, networking opportunities, online yoga, book clubs, and more. Be sure to introduce yourself when you join. Link is in the description. Now really back to the show. And it sounds like you're just continuing to build on experiences that you've had on the past, similar to like you being with the medical examiner in senior year and then doing an internship. You, you got the, the, the experience of working with students as a American student success coach. And now you get into both use knowledge that you have from your MPH program and mm -hmm. the, that prior experience to really help and shape. And, and, and that's awesome. And I think this is, I think it's really cool when people are able to get involved with nonprofits, especially before like a master public health program, because then you're able to bring a lot of like real life experiences to, to the program and to the things that you're leading. And so many times, like we just learn a lot of theory and theory is just theory without practice, but like actually right. being able to feel having the real life experiences is so important. So, so that's really cool that you're able to, to be part of this and continue to be part of this. And I look forward to seeing how that organization grows and, and the impact that you're able to make in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Um, I have to agree with you about um, the importance of like doing things in practice. When I made the decision to, uh, to, to be in an MPH program, I was very adamant about wanting to still work full time and still do things in practice. I think for me, that's been the perfect balance um, because a lot of what I'm learning in school, I'm applying in real time um, to, to what I do. Um, so for me, it's been super useful and um, it's, it can be tricky to manage at times, but um, I always encourage people to, to consider that option you know, of, of doing school online if, if it works for you. Um, and, and working in the field, uh, because ultimately you could get the MPH, but ultimately if you don't have experience, you're still going to need experience after the MPH to, you know, to do the type of work you want to do. So um, I'm really happy that you mentioned that because I think that's key for people who are, are, are interested in our field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think like 
whether that's like getting experience before working during and like really like bringing those real life things oh this happened last week in the work that i was doing and how it relates to like the class work or course work and, and examples i think is, is very helpful and helps not only yourself but everyone else in the classroom as well just get like a broader understanding of how public health works in real mm -hmm. life uh, which is which is important um so what what so you, you you're currently a master public health candidate at johns hopkins bloomberg school of public health when and what was that that thought process to like finally say okay yes i'm gonna get my mph or i'm gonna like pursue public health well what when did that happen for you so i had applied to um hopkins in 2019 so i think the end of 2019 is when i submitted my application um and like i had mentioned before at the time i was looking for opportunities in public health really trying to get into the public health field and I, I always um, wanted an MPH because even if I went to medical school, I always wanted to be able to practice as a physician through a public health lens. I felt like that was a super sort of useful set of skills to have. Um, and yeah, and so I was, um, I was researching schools at different schools at the time that had online programs. And um, contrary to the advice I received, I only applied to Hopkins which was super <laughs> risky, um, a lot of people would say. But again, going back to doing what feels right to you, that's what felt right to me. And if I didn't get into Hopkins in 2019, I was going to wait till 2020 and apply to Hopkins again. Um, I, really, I really like that, that Hopkins has such a global health focus. And because I want to do work not only in the U.S., but also in the U.S. Virgin Islands, I really felt like it was important to go to a school that had that. Um, and so that, that was one of the re major reasons why I had applied to Hopkins. Um, but yeah, that, that was sort of my thought process uh, at the time of applying. Um, initially, I was applying for the, I think, Bloomberg Health Fellow um, Fellowship. Um, I, I wasn't able to get into that, but I did end up getting a scholarship for my program. So, um, so I was super, super happy. And then I started the program formally in June of this year. So June, 2022, I formally began. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you for sharing that. And I, I could, that, that's awesome that, uh, I, well, awesome in some ways, uh, a little bit risky in, in the sense that you're just applying to one program, but like to up to the point of you saying like, this is the program that I want to do. I will wait another year if I have to and build more experiences while I wait and apply at that like kudos to you for having like that that termination that plan like just mm -hmm. knowing like this is the program that is going to help you get the knowledge and experiences that you want to to do the type of work that you want in public health which, which is awesome and and then i know before we started recording you were sharing about your concentration and how you're able to like how you how you're able to like kind of shape your concentration um, do you want to talk a little bit more about that and like your thought process of of what concentration you are doing and things like that mm -hmm. Sure. So um, like you had mentioned before, I, um, I'm in the MPH program. My focus is specifically in health equity. And um, as I was telling you before, uh, our school has specific concentrations like any MPH program, but you can also create your own sort of track or your own concentration. And so initially when I had applied um, to, to Bloomberg, I wanted to focus on adolescent health um, since I work with a youth nonprofit. But as I was um, going into the program and as I was doing work at the Florida Department of Health, I really started sort of realizing that I, okay, I, I want to acquire skills that could take me into any sort of area in public health. And I felt like health equity was a really good basis and framework with which to look at. Um, it's what we're all talking about right now, right? And all, all that we're, we're trying to do. But I really like the idea of Again, being able to take health equity, which is often this theory, and like bring it into practice. Like, what does it look like? Boots on the ground. What does it look like um, as people interact with systems? Um, and so, yeah. And so, I it's it's been really awesome because um, I've been able to sort of tailor my graduate education to courses that sort of build around health equity. Um, I think a lot of the public health curriculums now already sort of focus on that and have that that framework built in, um, especially over the past couple of years. But um, it's been good to be able to to really hone in on on health equity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm glad that you're able to kind of like see 
okay, it, it, adolescent health is something that is important to me, but I'm not too sure like if that is the only part of the field that I want to work in, but health equity is also important to me. And I guess in that you can do adolescent health work. You can do right. a bunch of other types of work and you can like really branch it out. So like kudos to you for like understanding that, that maybe you don't, you don't have like a specialized niche of, of like one thing that you want to do outside of like health equity, which can be its own niche in itself, but it, it doesn't mm-hmm. like, it, I feel like it doesn't hold you down to like, okay, you're going to do, child and maternal health or whatever the case might be it's broad in the sense that okay these are the techniques and theories and understanding of how health equity works and how we can get to health equity how can i apply this in whatever work i'm in which which i think is is a valuable skill and like just being able to translate it to different parts of public health is, is also mm-hmm. important i agree and i think for uh for a lot of students or individuals who are interested in public health or interested in the mph um, public health is such a vast field. Like every day we're all, all of us are learning about all these new and different types of jobs and lanes and niches in public health. And so um, my thought process when I was doing my MPH is I really want to walk away with my MPH by acquiring like a core set of skills. And it was less about me getting an MPH to get a specific job, um, which I think is could be a great goal if that's what you're shooting for. But for me, I was like, I want to get an MPH to get skills that I could take into any lane of public health. I could take into a company, contracting work, consulting work um, on a project in my local community. Um, that, that was really sort of my thought process with uh, my MPH. So uh, I, I just encourage uh, folks who are interested in an MPH and maybe not sure about a concentration to, you know, don't really worry about it too much. I think in the grand scheme of things, we all move around so much. I'm sure that's been your experience as well, Omari. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with that. And too many times, I, I think we say like, we want to do this one thing. And I like to your point, it's like the skill sets, what are the skill sets that you're gaining and how can you apply those skill sets to these range of different opportunities? Because as we know, in public health, it's ever changing. Your passions can change, your interests can change, but like, once you have skill sets, you can apply it to to anything, and uh, I think that that's a, a lot of like in my experience as well. Because when I when I was in my MPH, I did a lot of work around substance misuse, but mm-hmm. I don't do I don't really do much work around substance misuse now. A little bit, but mm-hmm. it's like what are the skill sets? Like focus group surveys, all those all those other things. Like learning how to read reports, learning how to get research and learning learning trends and giving recommendations. These are like the the skill sets that that you can gain and learn from the work. And you can apply it to so many different things. And uh, yeah, I, I think that that is definitely how a lot of people should be viewing the MPH or any other degrees. Like, what are these skill sets that I can gain from this? And how do I position myself to gain those skill sets? As well as how do I position myself to apply the skin, skill, skill sets that I'm gaining so that I can speak to it um, when I'm graduated, I'm looking for that next opportunity or whatever the case might be. So I, I, I really love that. And I think, yeah, because it doesn't really... Concentrations don't matter too much outside of right. like if you want to be an ep- epidemiologist, then, right. then maybe you need like core epidemiology concentrations. But outside of that, you it's like what skill sets you have and how can you translate that to whatever rule it is. Right. Yeah. Um. So you you well, I guess outside of the the um youth development VI, you have two other positions. So the first one is you're a research assistant in the Department of Health and Behavior and Society at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. So tell me how do you come across that and then what do you do in it? Sure. So um it's it's been really interesting. So I uh, work remotely in the Department of Health, Behavior and Society and I work on a NIH funded study that looks at stress and well-being for LGBTQ uh, men who have sex with men. Um, I've always been really passionate about doing work in, with, in populations that are marginalized, um, of high need, um, who are often overlooked. And uh, what I loved about this role is it's a lot more technical in nature. So I do a lot more of like survey recruiting, working with Qualtrics, um, more like data analysis. And I felt like those were skills that I hadn't really had before because I didn't do public health in undergrad. And so, um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a really great um, sort of flexible role to be a part of. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that during my MPH, especially because I was doing it online, that I find avenues 
still to connect with folks on campus, still to connect with with folks who are um at the school. And so um so yeah, it's been it's been really awesome, but it's given me a lot of insight into um a lot more of what goes into building surveys and administering them and recruiting individuals and folks. Um I'm still very new to the project, so I'm still learning a lot, but it's it's definitely been an insightful experience so far. Yeah, and I appreciate you sharing that as well, because I think that is probably one of the the biggest things that people would say, oh, I don't want to do an online program because I wouldn't be able to connect with the people in the program. And like to your point, you're, you're making it a point to to find opportunities where you're able to to be a part of the program, to connect with people, to build those networks, even though you're doing this online. And I, I guess like in that vein, what are they like other things that you're trying to do to like build a strong network at Johns Hopkins while you're being an online student? I love that you asked that question because I think in, in graduate school, um, networking begins from day one. Like you don't go through your MPH or go through your grad program and then six months before say, oh gosh, I need to network with people so I could get a job. No, you you should be networking from day one, honestly. And that was something that um, undergrad taught me. So I've been really intentional and strategic about, about doing that. Um, some great ways to really network as a student um, are going to conferences. Um, I had the opportunity to go to APHA, American Public Health Association's annual conference in Boston. Um, I went to the Society of Public Health Education conference in DC, um, as well as some other local conferences in the Central Florida area. And um, you know, also being a part of a health department gives you a great network, right? Because you have people um, in different counties doing different work in different regions. But um, that's pretty much been my approach to networking. I, try to treat it like another class, like another course in my program, because I know how valuable it is. So like I was saying, my approach to networking um, has been to meet people just because like not waiting until you need a job opportunity or recommendation, mm -hmm. just meeting people just because you never know like what sort of interesting work people are doing in the field, um, how you could learn from them or what you could teach them as well. So um, I really try to take advantage of opportunities like this to speak with individuals like you who are doing really great work and connecting with different folks in the field. Um, and like I said, taking advantage of conferences. Uh, I'm also a part of the Florida Public Health Association. So that's also been a really great space to network um, with folks as well. Um, but yeah, I would say like treat networking like it's a whole other um, major part of your program because it's necessary and it's a skill that you need, you know, in your profession as you continue to grow anyway. That's a great framework to think of things and gives people like actionable. Okay. Like this, this is how much time I'm spending on this course. Like, let me think about how can, how can I actively do networking for this amount of time to, and because, yeah, I, I think like, as you say, too many people try to make connections too late or they, they're trying to like force relationships, which essentially is what networking is. But like, as you know, as we know, it, it takes time to build those networks and relationships and you have to be like intentional and understanding okay, where do I want to go and how, who are the people that I should be connecting with who can like help me think through what are my next steps, what are the skill sets, who are the other people that I should be talking to, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that is a, a key key tip. I think any, any student should, should really like try, to, try to incorporate into their program. Right. And, and for those individuals who networking can be challenging, because for me, um, I may seem vocal now, but reserved is my personality um, and any regular day. And so um, that's where having mentors is really useful. Um, one of my mentors, who is the president of the uh, Florida Public Health Association, I attended APHA with her and 60% of my time there was her introducing me to random people that I don't even know. Some I know on LinkedIn, some are big names in public health. And um, she knew them, she felt more comfortable talking. So I really just was going with her along along the ride. So that's, I just wanna say that's the importance of, of mentorships as well for those folks who may be a little bit um, concerned or anxious about networking. That's where like leaning on colleagues and mentors is really useful because for those like she loves to talk, she loves to interact. I was like, great, I will just stand here and smile <laughs> and, 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 and nod my head and um, be in this moment and this space. 
Yeah, yeah, that, that that's very important as well. Like having people around who are going to put you in spaces and connect you and just like trying to have your best interest at, at heart, uh, which is awesome. So I'm glad that you're able to do that, uh, even though you're more introverted, uh, mm -hmm. as you say, I do not know, <laughs> that, that you're able to have a mentor that, that's more extroverted and was able to like connect you with all these people and people that you did know through, through online ways or just new people in general, which is, I think, very important. And I think one, one of the, the main things you can take away from conferences, especially ones like APHA. Um, so I'm glad that you highlighted that as well. Yeah. And uh, so you shared that you work at the Florida Department of Health. So you work as a Closing the Gap Program Coordinator and Health Equity Lead. So tell me more about how, how you come into this position and then uh, what do you do? So funny enough that we were talking about networking. I, um, the Assistant Director of our Health Department, I literally randomly added her on LinkedIn like two years ago, um, have been in conversation with her over those two years, um, trying to see if there's a role and a fit for me. And um, I was able to eventually interview for, for a role at the health department. And I've been there for um, a little bit over a year now. Um, and I wanted to share that because I know sometimes it can be daunting to just reach out to people who are very far ahead in public health but I literally wouldn't have this job if I made that move. So, it, I mean, it's either yes or no, right? Um, so might as well take, take the opportunity. But um, I, my role at the health department has been really um, dynamic for me, especially being in the MPH program. I've been able to apply a lot of the skills that I'm learning, um, vice versa. Um, the work that I do with Closing the Gap, so I kind of do two different, two main roles. The work that I do with Closing the Gap has focused on increasing referral capacity um, in our county. So my health department is working on adopting a electronic referral platform that will increase people's access to services. I know we talk a lot about access to services, but if we're not really tracking how we're doing that, it's kind of hard to tell if referrals are, are you know, are, are really um, being helpful. So that's sort of my main role working on that specific grant. Um, and then as a health equity lead, I work um, on the health equity team at the health department. And we are tasked with choosing a health disparity and creating a health equity plan that focuses on different um, systemic social determinant of health projects. So the health disparity that our county has been focused on is infant mortality. And so we've been um, you know, leveraging different partnerships with our task force to try to address uh, infant mortality in our county. Um, I will tell you that in Seminole County, uh, the disparity in infant mortality between black and white is more than three times. And so um, we have been really um, trying to align a lot of different partners and agencies in this work to try to really move the needle over the next couple of years. So it's been a great experience, especially since health equity is my focus in my MPH program. And um, I, I've just been able to take away a lot um, with, the, with the great people I work with. Yeah, no, that, that's great that you're doing that. Closing the gap work, uh, I, I think is like very important. Like, how do you evaluate if you're being effective in referring people, like you create a, a portal to like kind of track that to better understand it. And health equity definitely aligns with everything that you've been talking about. And like, it, it's cool that you're doing health equity work in the MPH and now getting to actually like literally practice it and try to incorporate that into the work that you're doing in your day job, which I think is is very, very important. And uh, if you're able to do that throughout your, your program, I definitely recommend it because it's, it's very formative and helping you like more speak to <clears throat> things that you're learning in your program and have concrete examples for that. Uh, so yeah. that, that's awesome. It's yeah. been awesome I, because I, um, I, I mean, usually at the beginning of your program, you know, you create a plan for what courses you're going to take, when you're going to take them. But I've been pretty flexible with which courses I take and when um, based on different skills or different challenges I'm having in my actual day job, I'll then sort of shift what courses I feel like I want to focus on. So for example, um, I work, I lead a health equity task force um, and, um, you know, leading a team of people is one thing, but leading organizations and entities can be so tricky. And so um, I, after leading the health equity task force for some time, I was like, I really need some, to acquire some more skills and multi-sector collaboration. 
I've done a little bit, bit of it before, but I feel like I need more concrete skills to, to really do that effectively. So I, I took a collaborations collective impact course um, in my program to really help with that. So I just wanted to mention that because that speaks to the value of working while doing school, because as you are kind of hitting challenges and hurdles and roadblocks, you can then um, try to see if there are courses or maybe even different projects that will help you sort of acquire some of the skills in areas where you feel like you, you need some improvement. Yeah, and, and that talks to the self-awareness of knowing like, okay, I don't know much about this. How can I go about gaining the skills or the understanding or what are the resources that I have? And like, as you said, the going to school, you have a lot, a lot of resources to mm -hmm. learn about uh, a lot of different topics and skill sets in public health. So yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And then before we get into your future predictions and then the Furious Five, I wanted to ask, like, were there any questions that you had or something that you had for me that you wanted to think through? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have to, there are two questions that um, come to mind for me. Um, as I had mentioned to you offline before, I've been following the public health millennial for some time. Um, I feel like I'm a fan, low key. Um, <laughs> so I, it, it feels really great to be here and I'm super proud of you and and the amount of traction and um, consistency that you've gained uh, with this platform. Um, it's even more heartwarming that you are someone from the Caribbean, someone who's Black in this space, because we, you know, we don't often see enough of that. So my qu two questions for you are, how did the public health millennial start? And how did you get um, into public health? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate you being a fan and supporting and following along. That, that means a lot. Um, and how how did this start? So it, it started essentially from me finishing my MPH program. And I should pre preface this by saying, like, before my MPH program, I was planning to go to medical school. Um, within, like, a couple of weeks of my MPH program, I decided, like, that was not the path that I wanted to take, wanted to stick in, in my MPH program. And like you, I was similar to you, I was a bachelor's in biology major, pre-med. Um, and to my dismay, I never heard about public health until I was looking for graduate school programs afterwards. And I, I thought that that was a travesty, a travesty. Um, so when I graduated, I was in Alaska and I had this, the time difference really gave me a lot more time on my hands. So I was like, let me let me create a platform to like help people and share things that I wish I knew during my program because everything that I learned in public health up to that point, there's just two years of learning from my MPH program. And like, I just really wanted to like do my best in public health and like find out how to be the most impactful. And I was like, let me share this. And uh, that that's kind of like how I started because I just wanted to help someone else figure out like that there's this really cool feel of public health out there that no one's telling us about and there's right. so many cool things to do and like even when you find out about public health it's like there's so many things in public health that you 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 can do so it's like how do you think about what what is the part of public health that I want to work in or what are the skills that I want to develop so that was like my onus for for creating the public health millennial and the next question was like what led me to to this and I guess like just going off of that, it was continuing to build a platform to support people because when I started sharing at first, it was very slow. <laughs> no, no one was, was paying attention. Um, but then slowly people would like DM me or message me on LinkedIn and said that, say that that was helpful or I would ask a lot of questions on LinkedIn originally, just asking for insights around public health things. And people would react to that or share their perspective. And I thought like that was very helpful and just creating a space to know more about public health and how you can get involved. Um, and just knowing that I was trying just doing this to, to kind of help one person and like, yeah. however, it, however it grew from there was, was like, okay, let me just help one person because I think a lot of us get carried away by trying to be quote unquote an influencer, whatever the case might be. But like my goal is always, uh, okay, how can I help? this one person out there and like if one person takes value from what I'm saying then I've won and like it was just a circle of me sharing stuff and getting feedback saying like this was helpful and then continuing to want to share stuff because it was helpful so that, that's how I got here and then like the podcast itself pandemic started and uh, I, listen, I was listening and watching to a lot of podcasts so I was like let me start my own because I, I realized there were a couple of them out there but I was like ah, I can do this better so, <laughs> so I started my podcast so right. that, 
yeah so that, that's why i'm well, here today congratulations on your journey to get here and um i am a supporter and will continue being a supporter and um i look forward to seeing like who else you bring on and where you go from here thank you thank you 2023 hopefully is gonna be a big year uh hoping to push out a lot of more consistent content with some great guests so like yourself so so look forward to, to seeing how that all unfolds and uh thank you for being a part of this platform and sharing along on my journey as you share your journey with everyone else um, for sure okay yeah 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 so where, where would you like to see yourself in the future oh that's such a hard question um <laughs> that i often despise to be honest like <laughs> you question that you're like oh, what do i really want to say this time um i to, to answer this question um one of the things i have been learning in my mph program is that I need to focus a lot more on what sort of work I want to want to be doing versus what type of role I want to have. I think there's a very big difference. I think we've been conditioned um, in academia and in our professional life to focus on a role, like a description during role. I want to be the CEO of this company versus the type of work that you want to be doing. Um, and so um, yeah, I, I, what the type of work I see myself doing, um, in years from now is really a lot of what I talked about, like being in, in a space where I can influence sort of some systems level, um, sort of change. Um, I really, what, one thing I really love about public health is its ability to influence systems, but also the innovation that public health, um, brings in. And so I really envision myself doing work in that area. I also, um, because I'm focused on health equity, I really would like to continue doing work in health disparities um, and specifically doing more work um, when it comes to health equity consulting. I think health equity um, is something that I think a lot of agencies and even hospital systems are still trying to quantify, like how do we measure if we're doing a great job at health equity, right? Because it's still this, um, it's still this sort of theory that's up in space that we haven't quite brought down to the ground and so a lot of the work i do has been trying to build skills that will help you know agencies or companies or groups like make health equity more actionable um and measure it um a lot more a lot better so um that's the sort of like work i want to be doing um as opposed to like maybe a specific role um that i would like to be doing but who knows you could ask me tomorrow and that might change because life is, is funny that way but um but but i'm but i'm happy where i'm at right now and, and where things are heading yeah life life is beautiful that way because i feel like as as especially in public health there's so many things that we can do and we don't know what we don't know and as you learn what you don't know it changes your perspective on, on everything but I, I love i love that um that that thought process of like work versus a role like what work do i want to do as opposed to what role do i want to be in because yes we we box ourselves in when we think about like a role as opposed to like the work we're going to do and like that goes back to your point of like this is the work i want to do what are the skill sets i need to do to to do this work as opposed to like trying to just figure out like what is this one specific role i'm, I'm trying to get into and, and i think that that's a, a important perspective that a lot of people can get value from um, especially in public health because mm -hmm. <laughs> there's so many ways that you can go in your journey so yeah i appreciate that a lot Absolutely. And, you know, even just when I was doing the job search into public health, a coordinator at one company versus a coordinator at another company is sometimes two very different mm -hmm. things. And so I was learning really quickly, like, OK, they're calling this a coordinator, but you really sound like a director here. So um, so I've really been learning to sort of focus a lot more um, on the trajectory of work. Um, I'm interested to know, like, what sort of work do you envision yourself um, doing in, in the next few years? Um, yeah, yeah, great, great, great question. And like outside of public health, Millennial just continuing to build this brand, this uh, platform, helping public health people. Um, I'm, I'm definitely, so right now I work for a health foundation. So in like the intersection of public health and philanthropy, nice. and currently I'm working on building out for our team, our, our capacity building, grassroots capacity building toolkit, hoping that I'll be able to like present at EPHA and, and stuff next year. So, so you all look out for that, but like, I'm just trying to become an expert in capacity building. And I like just being impactful in the work that I'm doing. And like, to your point, I had no idea about the role that I'm in like two years ago, you would, well, 
three three years ago now because I've been in it for two years. Um, but three years ago, I had no idea this was a role or this was a position that I can do. But I'm thankful that I built up the skill sets to do it. And I'm just continuing to learn more because I never knew about public health philanthropy in my MBA mm-hmm. program. So I'm just like learning and seeing where that takes me. And as I build up more knowledge of like health equity and how we action that as well as capacity building and how do we support grassroots mm-hmm. organizations to get to equitable systems change. Um, so something in that realm, we will, mm-hmm. we will see uh, where, right. where it all takes me. And, and you all will definitely hear more about it as if I transition out of, of this role into any other role. So, so I look forward to seeing like where that takes me. But as, as we all know, public health has so many opportunities. And I'm just looking looking forward to, to seeing how I can use whatever skill sets I have to make impact and, and improve lives for, for mm-hmm. populations and more, most likely populations that look like myself. That's awesome. And I, I love that you um, have are finding an interest in capacity building, because as we all know, for any of us who work that work in this field, um, you know, the public health infrastructure has taken a hit historically, like in terms of funding and support um, over the years. And um, we need people that are focused on capacity building to not only maintain our current workforce, but to grow, you know, the interest in the individual. So it's interesting how capacity building is what you do in your real work, but you're also doing capacity building in this podcast, you know? And so that's, 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 that speaks a lot to, 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 to your walk and to your journey. So just wanted to salute you for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I didn't really like think, think deeply about that, but yeah, everything you're saying there is absolutely correct. This is a lot of capacity building and giving people knowledge of, of what they need to, so we're giving them the capacity to understand what the things they need to do to get to whatever stage of their career they, they need to go. So, so yeah, I appreciate you highlighting that and asking that question. Um, okay, so moving on to the furious five, the five questions that I ask all guests. Number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Wow, that's a uh, good question. Um, the advice I would give to a student wanting to pursue a career in public health would be to, I kind of said this already, but it just feels so so pivotal, um, would be to just trust yourself. Um, I think public health is a super vast field with so, uh, so much to learn, so much to do. Um, and if this is something that feels right to you, if it's something that is calling towards you, then I would absolutely go for it. Um, I think public health is one of those industries that is a calling, I think. Um, everyone that I know that works in this field has some sort of story like we do about what got them here or what sort of experience or interaction that they had that led them here. So um, yeah, I would say if this calling is calling you, then answer it, you know, and and um, and you ha- you're in good company. So welcome, we welcome you to the field. Yeah, absolutely. Number two, if you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? And you can use the position as, I guess, um, the health department position that you have. Hmm. Um, I would say it's super, super important to know how to collaborate um, and how to be a team player. Um, we talk about it so much, but it's super, super important. In public health, um, there is no... Um, work without collaboration, right? And that that involves the people that you work with, that involves um, stakeholders and community partners, but it also involves the community themselves. So I would say for anybody that wants to be in my position, um, just be be able to be a team player really well um, and try to go for experiences, I guess, that really focus on sort of team-driven work. Love that. Love that. And yeah, that's an important skill in public health. Um, number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Ah, that's a good question. Um, something I'm working on improving. I honestly think just um, honestly balance, but that's always something I've honestly had challenges with. Um, I've always been the person that like does too much. Um, to be honest, so I try to take time, more time for myself, um, really invest time to take care of myself. Um, and I've been on this journey for so long, even back in undergrad. But um, but yeah, that's just something I continue want, want to continue to work on. I think I have periods where I'm, I'm better at that. Um, but 
I want to kind of normalize and make sort of my everyday routine and life uh, just space for me to take care of myself and, and have balance, have more balance. Love that. And we, we wish that on you too. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Professionally, do I recommend anything? Um, in, like I'm trying to think of maybe something I didn't mention. Um, I would say... I would say to just explore, like the explore and discover, you know, um, it's, it, I mean, you don't know if you don't want to do something until you do it. Right. I've had roles in so many different types of, you know, areas and in, in different places, but all of them have somehow been a full circle moments, you know, that have led me to, to where I am, as I mentioned in this podcast. So yeah, I would just say like, you know, feel free to explore, feel free to, to discover, give yourself the permission to do that. Um, because I think oftentimes we have a specific plan and we hold ourselves to that or people feel the need to hold ourselves to that. But feel free to, to, to just discover and explore things professionally. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, love that, love that. And then number five, last but not least, where can people connect with you? Okay, that's a great question. So um, people can connect with me on LinkedIn at Ajayi Pickering Haynes. We'll put up my information um, in the comments. Uh, you can also connect with me on um, on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is King Jai Blog. That's K I N G J A Y I B L O G. Um, and my Instagram is a lot more of you know, who I am as a person. Um, you might see some writing on there. You might see pictures, brunch, you know, just regular stuff because I'm a regular person like everyone else. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I would say LinkedIn or Instagram are great places to connect with me. I'm always happy to, to speak with anyone who's interested in this field or, or, you know, who needs any sort of like professional development, personal development sort of insight. Um, I'm always happy. So please reach out. Awesome, awesome. And yeah, I'll be sure to put all his information in the description and in the show notes as well so you all can check that out and connect with Ajayi. Thank you so much, Ajayi, for coming on and sharing all this great information with us today. Thank you, Omar. Eh? It's, it's been such a pleasure and such an honor. Thank you. Pleasure is mine. Pleasure is mine. Housekeeping items, everyone. Thank you so much for watching this. Be sure to subscribe if you have not as yet. Leave a like, leave a five-star review, and share it with a friend. Greatly appreciate you all, and I will see you all next week. Peace.